I have covered the Spartans substantially in the past. I have duly noted that there is a particular emphasis on the Spartan twos, mainly due to them being, in my own humble opinion, the best Spartans to date. But while I've spoken about Spartan armour systems, the augmentations of various generations, and looked extensively at the history, origins, training and psychology of the Spartan twos, I have neglected the generation of Spartans that are arguably more aggressive, clearly more numerous, and just as interesting. So as a means to counter this neglect, I'm taking steps to shed light on various aspects of the different Spartan generations, classes, and even teams and individuals. That starts today. Welcome back to Installation 00, and given that The Ghosts of Onyx is still one of my most favourite Halo books, I'm genuinely stunned I have yet to cover arguably the biggest revelation that that book had to provide, and that is the Spartan 3 program. My recent coverage of the history and origins of the ODSTs and my previous videos on the Spartan 2s has led me to the realisation that I need to be mixing these two concepts together, and where better to start than with the S3s. They are a class of Spartans trained by Spartans, and with a motivation to destroy the Covenant born of their own hatred and suffering in the loss of their families, friends, and homes to the Covenant War Machine. Needless to say, sources for this information can be found in Halo the Ghosts of Onyx, Halo Mythos, Halo Encyclopedia, Halo Reach, Halopedia, Halo Evolutions, Legacy of Onyx, Official Spartan Field Manual, as well as passing references from a ton of other books and in-game lore. But let's collate all of this information together and take a closer look at the history of the Spartan 3s. The Spartan 3 program was a top-secret project initiated by the Office of Naval Intelligence's Section 3, the Beta 5 Division specifically were in charge of the administration of this black project, and while it differed significantly to the Spartan 2 program, many of its processes, procedures, and statutes of the 2s were carried over to the 3s, including the use of young children as the primary candidates, and extremely extensive biological augmentation. This necessitated the continued need of secrecy surrounding the program. Fueled by the overwhelming success of the S2s, as well as the worsening condition of the war between humanity and the Covenant, the Spartan 3 program was conceived to produce much higher quantities of Spartan super soldiers to aid in the worsening war effort, but be able to do this while also making them cheap and expendable to stem the tide of the Covenant's onslaught against the outer colonies. In active service between 2536 and 2552, the Spartan 3s turned the tide of several critical battles of the Human Covenant War. After the war, the remaining Spartan 3 personnel were given the opportunity to join the newly formed Spartan Operations Branch, supplementing the numbers of the Spartan 4s. The Spartan 3 project was both a successor and supplement to the Spartan 2 program, created and engineered by Colonel James Ackerson of the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Spartan 3s were to be the next generation of super soldiers, composed primarily of vengeful orphans from fallen colonies. They would be cheaper to arm, train, and produce, being chosen from a wider pool of candidates. They would also be more numerous than their Spartan 2 predecessors. They would rely more heavily on teamwork and sheer numbers than advanced technology and equipment. To achieve effectiveness. The Spartan 2 program had been a dazzling success for the UNSC. Tales of Spartan super soldiers fighting off thousands of Covenant attacks had become the stuff of legend. Unfortunately, there were too few Spartan 2s to turn the tide of the war, 
Worse, the program's director, Dr. Catherine Halsey, had postponed the training of the new Spartan twos for years due to the specific age selection criteria, despite having candidates who met the genetic requirements. The Spartan II program also had several problems and deficiencies which overshadowed its success to the Office of Naval Intelligence. Firstly, the high mortality rate of the children during the augmentation was counterproductive to the goal of the program. Next, funding the Spartans, including their training and Mjolnir armour, cost as much as a battle group. Third, there were far too few of them to turn the tide of the war. Finally, even though the Spartan II program was not formally revealed to the public until 2547, the Spartans and their exploits had already attained a near legendary status within the UNSC. Even though the Spartans provided huge morale boosts for the UNSC, it was ultimately a problem for most of the Office of Naval Intelligence. Only operated in secrecy and anything that shone light on their operations was seen as detrimental to their efforts. Training in companies of around 300 at a time, with training regimes tougher than that of the Spartan II program, the threes were sent on high-risk missions that the UNSC could not accomplish, even with the orbital drop shock troopers. Though the casualty rates of the Spartan III stood at nearly 100% on some missions, to Oni, all the operations were strategic successes. They were trading lives for time against the larger, and technologically superior covenant. Only hoped that in time, enough Spartans would survive to train progressively more future Spartans, swelling the ranks of available super soldiers from only 30 Spartan twos in 2531 to roughly 100,000 Spartan threes within two decades. However, this never came to pass. Alpha Company was the first company of Spartan Threes to be trained. This group originally had 497 trainees recruited between the ages of 4, 5, and 6 years old. But only 300 would graduate to form the final Alpha Company. The children were orphaned by the Covenant attacks on various colonies such as Jericho 7, Harvest, Biko, and Iridanus 2. Navy recruiters would visit the children in orphanages, with the promise that they would be allowed to exact their revenge on the Covenant if they joined. The legality and exactly how this was accomplished is still subject to question, and still highly classified. From the moment they arrived on the planet of Onyx, the Alpha Company candidates were tested. When Alpha Company first arrived on Onyx, they met Chief Mendez the same man who had trained the Spartan Twos, and their commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Kurt Ambrose, in reality Spartan II Kurt 051, a behemoth super soldier standing at 8 foot 2 in his Mjolnir powered assault armour, who himself was kidnapped as a child to become a Spartan II, and kidnapped again from active duty by Oni in order to oversee the training of the Spartan Threes. They were only groundside for a few minutes before they were ordered back into the pelicans they had arrived on. That night they were instructed to paradrop to a designated pickup location. The vast majority of the crews did as they were ordered. On December the 27th, 2531, they formally began their training at Camp Curahi on Onyx, instructed by Lieutenant Commander Kurt Ambrose. Their aggression levels were extreme, with fights breaking out between some of the candidates moments after landing from their paradrop. Oni had concerns that the children would kill each other during training. Despite these concerns, Ambrose and Mendez were able to train them into effective soldiers and Alpha Company was declared active in late 2536. It is worth noting at this stage that when Alpha Company received their semi-powered infiltration armour and were moved into active duty, their collective age range was between 11 and 16 years old, with their mean age being only 13 years old. For full information on the Spartan III semi-powered infiltration armour, see my most detailed breakdown of SPI armour in the description. Individuals who failed to pass the training became drill instructors for Beta Company. These washouts were particularly ruthless to the trainees due to their regrets of not passing the test for the original Alpha Company. Before Alpha Company's deployment, 
Kurt and Mendez handpicked a small number of Spartans that stood out from the rest and removed them from the company, assigning them to special duties, such as elite fire teams and headhunter pairs. The Spartans were also issued more advanced equipment, such as Mjolnir powered assault armor, to make their battlefield prowess comparable to that of the Spartan IIs. Three of these individuals, Emil A239, Carter A259, and June A266, would later serve in a special operations unit known as Noble Team, along with candidates originally removed from Beta Company. Following Alpha Company's activation in late 2536, its members took part in several battles. After its deployment, Alpha Company quelled an insurrection on Mamor. Later, Alpha Company won the Battle of New Constantinople and performed successful operations in the Bonanza Asteroid Belt and the Far Gone Colony Platforms. Alpha Company also participated in six other battles during this time. In late July 2537, nine months after their activation, Alpha Company was sent to the Covenant-controlled asteroid K749 to disable as many reactors as possible so that its liquid contents of the facility would solidify and permanently clog their capacity to produce a metal the Covenant used heavily in the construction of their immensely powerful ships. Initial resistance to the Spartans was light, and they managed to disable two reactors before the Covenant would properly arrange a counterforce. The counterforce was neutralized with relative ease, and the Spartans managed to destroy 13 more reactors. By then, the Covenant had sent in a massive army from orbit. The Spartans were cut off from their extraction craft, and were promptly engaged from all sides by overwhelming numbers. Every last Spartan III of Alpha Company on the field of battle were killed. Prometheus was a bittersweet success. The facility was permanently disabled, but all participating members of Alpha Company were completely wiped out. The authorization and funding for Beta Company came in the wake of the destruction of Alpha Company during Operation Prometheus in 2537. While the loss of the lead company was unfortunate, Alpha's impressive combat record clearly made the Spartan III program worth pursuing. Beta was projected to produce 1,000 soldiers. However, even using expanded selection criteria, the number of candidates found with suitable genetic characteristics made this impossible. On the plus side, lessons learned from Alpha made it possible to graduate a larger portion of the recruits. As with Alpha, then Lieutenant Kurt Ambrose and Senior Chief Petty Officer Franklin Mendez were again charged with the training of Beta. 418 candidates gathered at Camp Curahi, Onyx. The camp was supervised by AI Deep Winter, replacing the previous AI Eternal Spring. After action analysis of Operation Prometheus resulted in an increased emphasis on unit cohesion during training. The vetting process to select 300 for augmentation was ongoing in 2541 and involved an array of unconventional training exercises as well as strenuous theoretical studies under deep winter every night. While the AI criticized the harshness of Ambrose's training regime, Kurt was confident it was necessary to ensure the Spartans could endure the stress of a live combat situation. The 300 Spartans of Beta Company graduated at some point prior to May 2545 and participated in an unspecified number of engagements, including Operation Cartwheel. Unlike Ackerson, who was quite prepared to see every one of the Spartan threes trained die if an appropriately high-value target could be found, both Kurt and Mendez tried to extract as many personnel as they could to stop them from being wasted on suicide missions. Ambrose believed that approximately 1.08% of the company could be absorbed into base personnel before Operation Torpedo due to the operation's expected high death toll. Spartan B-312 was deployed alone immediately after training, although Cat B-320 was more difficult to extract after Operation Cartwheel. Similarly, Kurt attempted to send Spartan B-170 and B-091 on deep space reconnaissance to avoid being sent as part of the Torpedo Assault Force, although this attempt was unsuccessful in Lucy's case. 
All of these Spartans were deemed in some way exceptional among their peers and thus too valuable to be wasted on suicide missions. Many were later equipped with Mjolnir powered assault armor rather than the cheaper but less expensive SPI armor, and deployed on missions more befitting their Spartan status, rather than the suicide missions they had been trained for. All of these extractions would result in Beta Company's Spartan III personnel surviving to fight in the Human Covenant War outside of Ackerson's chain of command. 300 soldiers of Beta Company were inserted via stealth drop pods onto Bagasi Delta on July 3rd, 2545 at 1135 hours. Their objective was to destroy a Covenant Deuterium Tritium fuel refinery. Nine soldiers dropped out of contact immediately after touchdown for unknown reasons. It is speculated that Oni may have stepped in and made the Spartans disappear for their own use, although it is also equally possible that the pods they inserted in failed and either killed them on impact or landed in the ocean, drowning them. The remainder proceeded towards the objective on foot and were engaged by Covenant forces that reacted with unexpected speed and strength. As the soldiers reached the refinery complex, the source of the Covenant response became clear. Seven enemy cruisers were on station and had escaped detection by UNSC reconnaissance satellites. In the face of such overwhelming force, an Omega-3 code was issued and Beta was ordered to retreat. Team Foxtrot ignored the order and continued to the objective and destroyed the refinery with heavy losses. The resulting explosion destroyed everything within a 4 km radius, including all Covenant forces and the rest of Beta Company. The only known survivors of the operation were Lucy B091 and Tom B292 of Foxtrot, who leapt into the nearby ocean to escape the blast and managed to pick their way to a Black Cat exfiltration craft. Lucy would not talk for many years to come. Gamma Company was trained with the help of the only two Spartan 3s from Beta Company who survived Operation Torpedo, Tom and Lucy. Lieutenant Commander Ambrose regarded Gamma Company as the finest of the Spartan 3 companies. 330 candidates were selected, on average only 6 years old, and at Ambrose's request all 330 were approved for graduation. Every one of them survived the augmentation procedures. Gamma Company received deployment orders only a few weeks after the fall of Reach and left Onyx before the Onyx conflict occurred. Only 15 Spartan 3s of Gamma Company remained on Onyx as they competed for top honours. Following the battle, seven had been killed in action. Team Sabre was the only Gamma Company team to fight alongside the Spartan 2 unit Blue Team. With the help of their older, more experienced counterparts, they successfully held off a Covenant attack along with destroying a Sentinel manufacturing facility until the Covenant forces surrounded the planet's core room antechamber. At this point, Kurt 051 would order the surviving Spartans of Gamma Company, the members of Blue Team, not including John 117, Chief Mendez and Dr. Halsey into the Shield World within the core of Onyx while he remained in situ to hold off the Covenant forces until the core room closed. Kurt, now alone and mortally injured from a previous firefight, listed the Spartans fallen in the battle as MIA, including himself, alongside his former identity as Spartan 051. He successfully delayed the Covenant forces until the slipspace portal had closed. In his death throes, Kurt had a hallucination of the fallen Spartan 2s and 3s by his side, nodding and giving him the thumbs up signal, forging his resolve to complete his one final task. Fleetmaster Vorona Mantakri then approached him, gloating that once the demon was dead, the Covenant would reopen the Shield World portal. Laughing in determination, Kurt replied, Die? Didn't you know? Spartans never die. He then detonated two Fenrir nuclear warheads, wiping out the Covenant army 
and thus preventing the Covenant from following his comrades and gaining access to the technologies inside the Shield World. After the Human Covenant War, the main body of Gamma Company was integrated into the newly formed Spartan Operations branch, though some members were returned to non-combatant status. The Spartan Threes on Onyx, having joined Blue Team, were later recovered by the Office of Naval Intelligence. They continued to serve with Blue Team until July 2553, when Admiral Margaret Parangoski decided to reassign three Gamma Company Spartans into a top-secret ferret unit while officially listing them as KIA to prevent knowledge of their illegal enhancements. The Ferret team later worked with Blue Team again to stop a bioweapon plot. Spartan G-059 remained in active service and was deployed on a mission to assassinate Avu Med Telkam on January 2558. Delta Company was a group of Spartan III candidates that were going to initiate their training in late 2552 at Camp Kurahi on Onyx. In late October 2552, the UNSC Adjing Court delivered supplies for Delta Company, the candidates of which had yet to arrive, when the Onyx conflict occurred. The fate of the Delta Company candidates following Onyx's destruction is unknown. In addition to the standard company formations, many Spartan Threes were withdrawn after training to serve in specialist units. Most of these Spartans served under the operational command of the Navy and the Army, though some served in the Marine Corps, and a select few in the Air Force. Oni's Beta 5 Division considered specialist Spartan Three teams useful for bargaining chips in internal politics of the UNSC Armed Forces using them to achieve ends relevant to their interests, such as securing given branches leadership support for the program. Alpha and Beta companies initially had 497 and 418 candidates respectively, although only 300 would become Spartans within each company. Of the washouts from these companies, most would later become drill instructors for their successors, however there may still have been a large recruitment pool from which to draw members for specialist teams. At least six Spartans, Emil, Carter, June, Tom, Kevin, and Rosenda were culled from Alpha Company, though the extent of these personnel withdrawals is unknown. Lieutenant Commander Ambrose believed that as much as 1.08% of Beta Company could be folded into base personnel prior to the attack on Pegasi Delta, which was expected to be a bloodbath. Spartan B-312 was pulled immediately after training and deployed as a lone wolf by an unknown superior. Cat, as we know, became a member of a noble team. Rosenda, A-344, served in the non-company personnel rotations and was considered as a possible replacement for a meal at Noble 4 due to the latter's excessive hostility towards insurrectionists. Only Spartan 3s who had survived two or more specially assigned training missions could join the Headhunters. These two-man teams of Spartan Threes went on missions far behind enemy lines and were typically expected to die in combat. The Headhunters' existence was secret even to their peers. Once selected, candidates for the program were separated from their fellow Spartans and sent to specialist training camps on the far side of Onyx. The Headhunters were comprehensively evaluated in order to ensure an effective bond between the members of each team. A contingent of six two-man teams, as well as five additional headhunters, was maintained at all times to ensure the program's numbers remained constant should one or both members of a team be lost. At least two headhunters, Jonah and Roland, wore semi-powered infiltration armor that was much more advanced than the suits issued to most of the Spartan Threes. It included energy shielding, motion trackers, and visor technology, and could also support a prototype active camouflage module. The Headhunter program remains active following the establishment of the Spartan branch, albeit with some organisational changes. Out of those Spartan threes withdrawn from their companies, many were equipped with Mjolnir-powered assault armour and deployed similarly to the Spartan twos, rather than on suicide missions like their peers. These Mjolnir-clad Spartan threes played a crucial role in many battles throughout the war in every branch of the military. Since the public was not aware of the distinction between the Spartan twos and threes, the latter let their predecessors take the credit for their actions. Many Mjolnir-clad Spartan Threes defended the planet Reach during the Covenant's invasion of the planet. Gauntlet, Red, and Echo teams were rumoured to be deployed in civilian evacuation operations on August 23rd. 
Concurrently, an unknown number of both Spartan 3s and 2s were deployed to the capital city of Caspar on tribute. A Spartan 3 fire team held off a bevy of Covenant vessels while a small number of civilians escaped aboard a transport craft. Though the entire team was killed, the Spartan 4s on the UNSC Infinity would later pay homage to their courage with a simulation of the engagement. By 2000 hours on August 30th, 13 Spartan 3s had perished near the Azod shipbreaking yards, the last evacuation pod on the continent of Ipoz. Soon, Spartan B312 of Noble Team would die in the same location in a valiant last stand. The Spartan 3s are generally highly dedicated and goal orientated. Much like the Spartan 2s, their training emphasised duty as well as the importance of winning. Unlike their predecessors, however, they had an existing motivation upon which their indoctrination and their training was built as a result of their background as vengeful war orphans. Many of the Spartan 3 candidates were very lively and aggressive, to the extent that some initially doubted whether they could be trained into effective soldiers at all. However, the program was ultimately able to drill military discipline and teamwork into the trainees, and several improvements were introduced to the Spartan 3's training over the program's successive generations to further ensure this. As in the Spartan 2 program, teamwork and camaraderie among the trainees was both encouraged and developed naturally as a consequence of the Spartans' way of upbringing. As a result, the bonds among Spartan 3 teams run extraordinarily deep. Kurt Ambrose described Spartan 3 units as being more family than fire team, a sentiment echoed by the Spartan 3s themselves. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons and YouTube members, Neek the Silent Cartographer, Kyle Stevens and Siphonic Storm, my Tier Zero Transcendence. Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, Stalker of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin, Mr. Fell, Flaming Halo, Starlight, Legions Lost, Josh, the TG7, Cat Herder Cam, Schneidish, Leon, Ignizzle, and Alpha Therapy, the Holders of the Mantle, My Glorious Reclaimers, My Most Loyal of Metarchs, and all the other patrons and members that have jumped aboard to support the channel. Much love to you guys, thanks so much for your support, it's keeping things happening and helping the development of the channel and future awesomeness in a big way. If you like Halo Lord discuss to insane loves of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord, and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there, or jumping on as a channel member. It would mean the world to me and affords you loads of great perks and bonuses and helps working towards something pretty awesome I've got planned in the near future. Take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.